All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Personal Development Without the Fluff. And uh, I have the triumvirate here today. Guy is with me here as well. Guy, you want to say hi? Hello, hello. Hi, everybody. So, you know, generally when I bring Guy on, that means that we have an awesome guest, that we're going to have an amazing conversation. And um, this guest, I always do pre interviews, and I literally left the pre interview with like, tingles in my body of excitement um and i'll just give a short bio <laughs> i'll give a short bio i want ariel to actually share who she is and how she got here but this is why this is so exciting for me you know that guy and i talk a lot about spirituality and healing and things like that and when i spoke to ariel it was this profound combination of spirituality with uh psychotherapy incredible science and neuroscience technology all of these things merged into one i was like i've never met anyone that has all these capabilities we found so, the unicorn it was really really fun so first and foremost ariel garden welcome to the show thank you it is a joy and a pleasure to be here i'm um, super excited to have you so um i would love for you to share a little bit about yourself and what you bring through in the world and then we'll jump into all the other cool stuff Sure. So my name is Arielle. And as you said, I have a background that spans neuroscience, psychotherapy, design, technology. Um, I've always been fascinated by the brain and how it works. And my mission in life right now is to help people understand that you don't have to live with whatever cards you've been dealt in your brain, that the stories that you tell yourself about you do not necessarily have to guide who you are and how you live your life that we're often fed these really broken narratives and we have brains that resurface them constantly and you have a choice of what's in your head. So the way I've brought that to reality is working in neuroscience labs from neurogenesis through Parkinson's disease. I was a practicing therapist for almost a decade and now I make a wonderful device with my team called Muse. It's a brain sensing headband that helps you meditate. <laughs> so where we talk, I mean, you guys have probably heard us say these very similar things, like this is what we're striving for to, to bring change in the world. Ariel actually went out and created a tech device that allows you to do this, which is just so cool. Um, so my first question is this, you know, with this big mission that you have and the product that you're launching and bringing through, uh, tell a little bit of like how this thing works and what the intention of it, like why would someone use Muse? Sure. So Muse at its core helps you meditate and now helps you sleep better. We all know that meditation is good for you, but meditation is frankly really hard to do. You sit there and your brain bounces all over the place and you're like, what is my mind supposed to be doing? And there's no little coach sitting inside your brain telling you when you've done it right and encouraging you to do it again. And we recognized with an early brain computer interface technology that we were using that we could actually solve that problem. So Muse tracks your brain during meditation and gives you real-time feedback to know when you're focused and to know when your mind is wandering. The metaphor we use is your mind is like the weather. So when you're thinking and distracted, you actually hear it as stormy. And as you come to quiet, focused attention, it quiets the storm. So it's literally reading your brain during meditation and giving you real-time feedback, letting you know where your brain is at and where it needs to be, and reinforcing you for staying in the meditation zone. And then after the fact, we have data, charts, graphs, scores, things that actually show you what your brain was doing moment to moment, let you reflect back, and let you see your improvement, let you see the change in your meditation session after session so you know where you're going. For the entrepreneurs out there, they're like, oh my God, oh. the overachiever part is like, yes, let me, let me be the best meditator in the world. <laughs> Data-driven meditation. Let me compete and win and meditation. <laughs> we show the world that I am the best meditator <laughs> ever with the I've most actually, points. I've actually, I've actually seen people use Muse exactly for that reason. They're like, I was in, meditation. I was in alpha for 18 minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So along the way, I mean, it, yes, it can hook those who are really into competition, but it hooks you for the right reasons. And then yeah. as you go through the practice, you're like, oh, this is what meditation is. And then the benefits start to unfold and you're like, oh, maybe I don't need to be so goal directed in this way because now I can understand, you know, the ways that it tricks me and hooks me. So from a healing perspective, you know, and you, you really bring this like neuroscience of meditation to it. And from a healing perspective, obviously... Uh, as someone that's been practicing for years, daily meditation, like I, I can feel 
the difference that it makes. And I know that there's these people out there that, you know, will dip their toe in it. They'll do like two, three, maybe four days a week and then stop and then kind of like do that. Um, you had set a really large goal with the idea of bringing technology to the healing forefront for humanity. Can you just talk a little bit about that and how this whole kind of came to be? Because I think that's kind of the big picture here. So for us, we were really trying. So when I say us, it's myself and my co-founders, Chris and Trevor. We were really trying to figure out how to use this early brain computer interface tech that we had in order to make the world better. And so we literally had a technology where you could put an electrode on the back of your head and by shifting your brain state, focusing or relaxing, you could brighten a light bulb. You could turn on sound. We used it to control the lights on big buildings at the Olympics. We did amazing things, but all the time kind of searching for what it was that was actually going to make people's lives better palpably every day. And since I was a therapist and neuroscientist, you know, I'd be teaching my patients to meditate and I sucked at it myself, but I understood the benefits. Mm -hmm. And Trevor was a practicing Buddhist, so he deeply understood the benefits of meditation. Mm -hmm. And we recognized that even if our technology completely failed, if we could just get more people meditating, we would be doing something really beneficial for the world. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that the technology actually worked and, and now it is really true. We have hundreds of thousands of people who meditate using news. And it's at the point where I have now met meditation teachers who have started their meditation teaching practices because they started meditating with views for the first time. Amazing. And now like that you've gathered this data, I know the journey of helping humanity is you, you guys feel like you're just scratching the surface and you're constantly evolving. So you had mentioned before and on our pre-interview that new muse actually helps with sleep and takes people into sleep and then there's some new things that you guys are working on as well can you share a little bit about that as well absolutely so for us it's about helping people understand what's going on inside their mind and body and harnessing that information to your best purpose so when you meditate it's both a process of being able to calm and quiet the mind observe the mind and focus the mind. So there's multiple things going on. And mm -hmm. it's a process of being able to shift your physiology, be able to slow your heart rate, to take deep breaths, which tugs on your vagus nerve and tells your um, autonomic nervous system that it's time to go into rest and digest, and which then allows your mind to be calmer. So there's a great relationship between the body and the mind in this process. And so uh, with Muse, we have sensors for the heart, the breath, the body, um, as well as the brain. So you can get real-time feedback on all of these systems. And then we started to look at the 24-hour experience of the self. So you're calming and focusing the mind during the day. You're then able to apply that knowledge that you've learned at night as you're falling asleep. So you can then sleep more effectively at night, then wake up the next day more refreshed, more cognitively capable, more, with better emotional self-regulation. And then the process of learning to manage your mind the next day becomes more effective. So we created this purpose-built device called Muse S, which is a very comfortable little headband that has EEG sensors, accelerometer, PPG, gyroscope, SpO2. It's packed with sensors. And we give you these amazing responsive go-to-sleep journeys. So it's a guided meditation that lulls you into sleep, as well as a responsive soundtrack that's actually built from your body. So you might hear the chirping of crickets, which is actually the beating of your heart. So every beat of your heart, you hear like the chirp of a cricket. Mm -hmm. And as your heart begins to naturally slow down, so too does the soundtrack slow down. It's following your body. And then at a certain point, it begins to actually entrain your body and to slow down even further, causing your heart to slow down in a way that's designed to lull you into sleep even faster. So we recognize that we could have the opportunity to teach your mind and body how to apply these techniques throughout the day and the night in order to improve your rest and improve your cognitive function. Is your uh, full-time gig right now just operating the company or are you still involved in doing uh, work around neuroscience? So... I have the best full-time gig in the world. Uh, I stepped down as the CEO when I went on maternity leave uh, three and a half years ago. Okay. And so now my job is teaching people about meditation and neuroscience and the power of controlling your own mind. So what is something that you guys have discovered that might be surprising for people about like the connection? Yeah, that actually looking at the brain while people are in a meditative state. 
So we did a really interesting study and we looked at some of our data and what we were actually able to see is the change in a marker of brain health over age. So mm -hmm. alpha peak frequency is something that can be considered a marker for brain health. When you're young, your alpha peak frequency is quite high. Let's say it's around 10.25. Um, as you age, that alpha peak frequency decreases decade by decade. So when I say alpha peak frequency, your alpha band is typically from like 8 to 12 hertz. So your peak frequency would be the frequency that has the most amount of alpha in it. And as you age, that decreases. So by the time you're 70, your alpha peak frequency might be closer to 8. By the time you're 80, it might be closer down to 7. And we looked back at our database at individuals across different ages and across different genders, and we could actually see decade by decade the change in alpha peak frequency. And that was a finding that has never been seen in the literature before. Huh. What's, what's uh, correlated to creating that change? Is it hormonal, stress-related, environmental? Is it everything? It's everything. I mean, your, your yeah. brain essentially slows down as you age. Um, you can think of that alpha peak frequency as your refresh rate. And so mm -hmm. when you're really young, you know, you're, you're literally on the ball and your refresh rate is really high. And as you age, that refresh rate slows down. There is the opportunity to intervene and the potential for tools like meditation to be able to improve your alpha peak frequency, for example, as alpha is one of the aspects of your brain that improves during meditation. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what I was going to ask, like in your studies, people that have been practicing meditation for long periods of time, it, does that slow down happen at different intervals? Can they maintain a peak, a higher peak state? So we haven't gone in and looked at that specifically. That's a great second step. Um, we have a study running right now with Baycrest Hospital with 100 older adults with um, mild cognitive decline using Muse. And they're using it in two ways. One as a, actually three ways. One is a meditation intervention to help their stress. Um, two, to look at the changes in brain state. And then three, as a tool to be able to gather EEG from that population. So if you are somebody with dementia, it's really hard to get a clean EEG reading from you because your head is very sensitive, you're probably quite frail, and you don't like somebody futzing around for 45 minutes to put a bunch of wires on your head. Yeah. And so what the researchers there are finding is that it's astonishingly easy to actually be able to see the EEG from this population and to see a marker. It's called the event-related potential. So when you see something in the world, you then have a corollary event in your brain. So let's say a light flashes, and then you might see a P300, it's called, a little peak at 300 milliseconds after that light. Now, these event-related potentials are very sensitive to various cognitive factors. So if you have caffeine, that will change your ERP, event-related potential. If you're underslept, if you have a concussion, it changes it in predictable ways. So they're actually able to look at the event-related potentials of these older adults using Muse, um, which is actually quite a hard thing to do, but seems to be working really well. And so part of the study is going to be looking at the meditation intervention and seeing the improvement, um, just seeing their EEG overall, because that is actually kind of a, a, a novel finding, potentially creating a tool that can then be used as a diagnostic, and then also seeing the change through meditation of these various brain markers. So that's something that we'll be seeing at the end of the Baycrest study, probably in about a year. Wow. Are you, guys, are you guys now considered the biggest database for collection of EEG in the world? Yes, we're probably the largest database of EEG data. Um, and there's, so when somebody uses the Muse, you can be asked if you would like to join our research program, which then allows accredited third parties like Baycrest Hospital doing a dementia study um, to anonymously look at the brain data for science. Um, and then if you don't join the research study, we have absolutely no access to it. Wow. Sure. Can I ask a super sci-fi question? Of course. <laughs> um, so the machine right now, the way it, it registers signals that are being outputted from your brain. Yes, correct. Um, your brain waves. Yeah. So I think, I think it was in Stealing Fire. <laughs> he was talking about the possibility of having same kind of like headgear that would actually send inputs. And the idea would be that we can 
code, for example, like a monk that's been meditating for 40 years on top of a mountain and actually pick up those brain frequencies and then send them back into someone else's brain so that they actually have that experience in real time. Is that like super far-fetched or is that something that you think we can actually get to in our lifetime? Good question. So to clarify, we only read. EEG is passive. It's just picking up the energy that comes off your head. And we will never get into something that is active. We will never get into putting current or frequency into your head. Um, It's very important for us that this is only reading. And then we give you feedback about what's going on in your own brain so that you can learn. There's no like enlightenment button that you can press. (laughs) Moving (laughs) now into, unfortunately, I'm sorry. (laughs) I was going to say, is that that for legal reasons or for a lot? Curiosity is what would happen if we shot people with some frequencies in there. <laughs> um, so I do have colleagues in this space who are looking at that question. So I don't know if you've heard of Shinzen Young. Um, he's a very famous monk, and he's been worth working with Jay Sanguinetti, who's a neuroscientist, and they've been trying to map where in the brain these uh, you know experiences of meditation come from, and if they stimulate those areas, can they get meditation-like experiences? And wow. so they've been experimenting with uh, very ultra-low frequency ultrasound. Um, and so in a very like low power, low intensity ultrasound, and they're stimulating a specific part of the brain. Uh, and when they do so, they seem to be able to produce the experience of no mind. So no yeah. mind is a state that you know, highly experienced meditators get into where you feel no sense of self, no mind, um, and you are just completely at peace. It often also is associated with feelings of connection to one another and a connection to the universe. And so they've been, with their few initial you know, tentative test subjects, they've been able to get people to this experience. Wow. Um, I have another colleague, Lou Lim, and he uses uh, LEDs. So uh, red laser and red LED to stimulate various parts of the brain. And he's been able to get people to some also quite euphoric and meditation-like experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're curious about this stuff, I have an Untangle podcast. I host a podcast called Untangle where we talk about neuroscience in the brain. Um, And we have an episode with Jay talking about his technology. And we'll probably have one with Lou coming up. That's awesome. I'm I'm hooked. I would love to sign up for either of those trials, by the way. (laughs) I'll give them your name. <laughs> uh, this might be a little bit out there of a question, um, but just like speaking on the idea of awareness in general, mm-hmm. uh, so, you know, like as a meditator, right? It, it's some like a question we ask ourselves is like, where is the awareness? Mm-hmm. So we, we would localize awareness generally behind the eyes, but it's like, that's a kind of a choice and awareness as you find when you meditate, you can kind of place it everywhere. So it's like very curious that they're doing this brain work to me you know, trying to stimulate something or find the patterning in the brain, which I'm sure is happening. Um, I'm not really, I'm not clear on my question, I guess, but it's like, are you guys gaining insight into what awareness actually is? Because it is kind of this amorphous thing that we're experiencing life through that we could call awareness, but we can't really point out where it is located. Um, I'm just curious of like, how, what, what science of you on awareness, like where is localized? That's a fascinating question. So if we change the word awareness to the word consciousness, now we're in the domain of something that neuroscience thinks a lot about. Where is the locus of consciousness? And there are a number of theories that answer that, and they're all just theories. It has has yet to be actually proven. Um, The old theory was that consciousness came out of the binding principle. So the idea was there was this uh, wave, a gamma wave, and when the various percepts of your consciousness, so the things that you see, hear, smell, touch, the percepts, when these various percepts were all bound together by this one gamma wave that would move throughout your brain, um, the things that were bound together in that moment were the items that then became in your conscious awareness. So the things that you're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting at the moment when the wave hits them, it's like, okay, bam, that is consciousness. Mm -hmm. Um, Another way that we can talk about consciousness is attention. Um, and attention is something that we talk about a lot in meditation and the basic practice of Muse is a focused attention practice. So you put your attention on one thing, your mind wanders, you choose to bring your attention elsewhere. Attention is typically, um, dominated by the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain in the front of our head over here behind our forehead 
is the thing that determines or allows you to direct your attention, what you want to attend to, sight, hear, thought, smell, etc. There's another uh, theory. So those are two different frames to think about it. And one, what's going on in the whole brain, what's going from the brainwave perspective to what organ of the brain is being used. Um, Another theory of consciousness is the quantum theory of consciousness. Um, and this is actually has some good following. And the idea there is that, and don't ask me on the details of this, um, the idea there is that consciousness arrives, arises from the action of microtubules inside of your cells. And the vibration of microtubules at a quantum level is actually the thing that causes the existence of consciousness in the person. So those are three different sort of neuroscience frames to think about consciousness in. When we think about awareness from a meditation perspective, um, you can think about, you know, my brain and what it's attending to, where its attention is. You can think about consciousness as something that's distributed, and that's kind of the exercise that you were talking about. Um, one common meditation exercise might be to say, you know, awareness is and you can just, I've, I've done this for hours, you just sit there and say, awareness is. And sometimes the answer is awareness is me. Sometimes the answer is awareness is everything. Sometimes the answer is awareness is nothing. Sometimes the answer is awareness is the space between me. And you're trying to understand what your experience of awareness is. And the deeper you get down a meditation pathway, the more you get the sensation, and I don't know if it's a reality, but it's definitely at least a sensation or an understanding, that consciousness is something that is probably not just within the individual, but also connected between people. Yes. And the metaphor we use there is that if you look at the waves on the ocean, um, as an individual, you typically think about yourself as a thing that is bobbing on the waves. I am a discrete particle or a discrete thing and I'm just bobbing along and that is that is my consciousness. As a meditator, you think of yourself as the entire ocean and the individual just being the one wave that emerges from the ocean, but the consciousness is all. And so everyone is connected, not simply the way not simply the individual discrete waves being discrete. Yeah. So I there's a bunch a of long winded thoughts on consciousness. Yeah, no, no, it's amazing for attention. Yeah, how often do you really get the frame of a, of a science uh, you know, neurologist to look at things? I have like a bunch of questions on free will and, and things of that nature, but to, those would suffice my curiosity on like what you, the frame is and how you guys look at and talk about those things. Um, I think what's interesting though is like the, the idea of neuroplasticity. And so you, you mentioned like, right, that there has been this thought of like a fixed brain for a long time. And then in the last 20 years or so, we've kind of discovered that that's far from the case. And I'm sure a lot of people who meditated and been in spiritual practice have known that for many years, but science is always finding ways to uh, quantify these things and make it more palatable for everybody else. So I'm, I'm curious, like, what are the steps that you guys are finding that work either on a majority of the population or on a certain amount of people that you find that if you're in some kind of fixed way of being that's causing you harm or others harm, or just generally not, you know, giving you like malaise about life, you're not enjoying your experience. And you're like, oh, if this one thing just changed about me, like I would be, you know, so much freer and much more liberated in my expression, whatever it might be. Like, what is it that you guys are finding that allows for the brain to make that switch and, and kind of move away from like a fixed way that it might be? Sure. Um, I mean, the short answer is practice because making that <laughs> really like making That's that switch answer. is really hard. Um, your neurons are wired together. And as soon as you do something else, you create a new neural connection. Sleep is important because sleep then allows you to uh, really facilitate those new neural connections and, and tend them. Um, and then practice because you need to take those fragile little branches of new connections and turn them into new superhighways. And so it really is a matter of practice. Um, what is that practice looking like? Well, within a meditation practice, for example, what you're doing is you put your attention on your breath, your mind invariably wanders off onto a thought. And instead of following that thought, which most of us do in our daily life, we instead say, nope, I no longer need to follow that thought. I'm going to make a different choice and put my attention elsewhere onto something yeah. neutral like my breath. And that moment when you make that decision to put your brain elsewhere, that is 
crucial. That is fundamental. That is the moment where you've said, I'm not going to follow the pathway that's previously been etched into my brain and that place where that thought wants to take me, that you know, road I've been down a thousand times that probably leads me closer to hell. I'm going to choose to, with my intention, with my will, with my prefrontal cortex, with my metacognition, those are all kind of synonyms for each other in some way, I'm now going to choose a different path. I'm going to choose to create or strengthen a different neural network that says my mind's not going down there, my mind is going elsewhere. And from there, from that exertion of your will, you then do that over and over and over again until over time you have less of those thoughts arising and over time you come better at sticking with your breath. And over time, the switch from the relationship of being in the default mode of your thoughts just constantly going and you assuming that's what's supposed to be there to a place where you can have real intentionality about what goes on in your own mind. I think that's super important for people to hear. Like, you know, one of the top things we teach, we train people on is like, you got to learn patience and grace. There's this like fundamental thing in society right now about, you know, getting what you want very quickly. You can download the app, get things delivered to your home. It creates this precedence of like, all of life should be this way. And the reality is, is like once in a while you do get these beautiful moments of like incredible insights and things seem to change very quickly. And like the foundation from which you view or live life really changes drastically. The reality is it's just like everything else though in life. If you want to get good at it, you need to have an intention set and have a commitment of time that you put aside every single day to, to create those changes. I'm really curious too now, like, you know, with, uh, our practice for a long time was in linguistics and neuroscience and psychology and understanding all these things. And what I found is, I think what we both have found is it's like, there's that practice of like changing your story, like reframing what's happening, you know, viewing it from a different way. And to a degree that's very powerful, very good. And allows you to get back in action, even when you might be experiencing things like anxiety, fear, overwhelm now. And I think this probably goes more to like Tibetan Buddhist traditions too. So I, I would imagine you have some, um, some say about this. It's like, there is a sensory experience happening in the body that the mind is viewing and interpreting and having an opinion about, and no matter how much understanding you seem to have or how many books you've read or how many courses you've taken, that the response in the body is still going to happen. Like if I yeah. get um, afraid by a blue truck, when I see a blue truck, I'm, I'm going to have a response in the body, even though my brain might say there's no threat over there. Yep. So I'm, I'm wondering like where, where is science positioning now on this kind of like body mind connection? Cause to me, and again, just speaking from my anecdotal evidence is like the mind is just full of illusions. It's full of mm -hmm. interpretations and of like uh, anything that really doesn't feel very authentic because the mind never really learned what authentic was because we don't live in a world where a lot of people are their authentic selves, but the body seems to relate to this reality in a very authentic way. So seemingly like authentic, probably actually not authentic. The body lies to us all the time. So, tell, so say, say more about that. Cause that's very interesting for me. What, what is it lying about and, and how is it lying? Cause I'm sure there's a programming happening here, but when I feel into like what's giving me clear feedback, would I trust my brain or would I trust my body? I'm like, I rather trust what my heart, and what my gut is feeling than what my brain is interpreting about what's happening in this reality. Well, look at trauma. I mean, in trauma, that is a body that is stuck in the past and is reliving something that is absolutely not here in the present, not, not real right now for you, even though it might feel real. That is a moment where the body also is caught up in extreme illusion, an extreme illusion that's actually quite detrimental to your being. It thinks it's trying to protect you, but it's not. Yeah. The present moment is completely safe. It is living in the past and it's constantly replaying that fear inside of your body and, you know, re, re articulating that fear and ossifying that fear in a way that's not useful. I think in most cases, when it comes to fear, the body is probably lying to you. You know, we have this beautiful amygdala whose job in life is to scan for danger. And that scanning for danger was incredibly useful when we lived in truly dangerous, physiologically threatening times, you know, when we had to look out for lines that might jump on our back or whatever it was. Um, you know, these days, our lives are relatively safe, but we have an amygdala that hyperreacts all of the time. And it's constantly trying to present to you information that it feels is dangerous and giving you sensations of danger in your body and thoughts of danger in your mind, even though we might have the ability to consciously say this is completely fine. We're still feeling the sensation. 
Like when you're stuck in traffic and you are frustrated because you're stuck in traffic and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to be late. And you, you know, you feel the flush in your body and the pounding of your heart. Um, and it's not going to be the end of the world that you're late. You're not going to be fired. Nobody's really going to care. But we keep experiencing the sensation in our body as if it's going to be terrible that we are late. Yeah. Um, and it's not. And then your amygdala constantly represents the thoughts to you because it thinks it's an important thought because it's about fear. And anything about fear disproportionately gets more of your attention. Sure. And so your mind gets pulled. And then because your mind thinks that it's got a thought about it, then your body has more sensation. And because your mind then interprets your body's sensation as, oh my God, there's a problem, it creates more thoughts about it in this feed forward cycle. And so anybody with anxiety should know so deeply that that feeling that you're feeling in your body is actually a lie. You know, it's like the alarm going off every single day in a burn in a building you think is burning, but it's not. And every single day you take your hat and your coat and you get down to the street because the fire alarm has gone off, but there's really no fire ever. So how do you, how do you shift that? Cause like a lot of mindset training, right. Is what I would say overcoming certain things. So like I have a certain fear around this, I'm going to reframe it, do all the stuff. And then I'm going to be able to have that sensation and overcome it and still get on with my day. Yeah. What, so yeah, go ahead. There is a couple of ways to retrain it. One is to have, first, you have to have the cognitive capacity to know that your body's lying to you and not get sucked in by it. And to be able to know that actually everything's fine. As a therapist, I once had a patient who was terrified that the floor was going to fall in. And, mm. you know, she'd be sitting there in deep panic in my office on the second floor of a relatively new building that, you know, has, hadn't gone anywhere. Nobody's gone anywhere. Sure that the floor was going to fall in. Wow. And it was, you know, everything I could do to convince her that actually it's fine. The floor is not going anywhere. You're safe. But it mm. felt so true in her body. And so her, yeah. the thoughts, you know, responded and then more sensation in her body and this feed forward. So you have to be able to get to a place where you know that actually you're safe. Actually, the floor is not going to fall and actually this is okay. And if you can get glimmers of that, you've got a leg up. You've got like a toe to stand on. The meditation is a fantastic tool for that because it teaches you to disengage the thoughts because the thoughts, you know, the amygdala will keep presenting the thought to you that there's danger and then your mind can keep saying, nope, my brain's not going there, back to something neutral over and over and over again as you train the new neural pathways of like, nope, not feeding into it. Another great way to retrain yourself against fears is exposure therapy. In exposure therapy, what you learn is that you don't have to be afraid of fear. Because in most of these scenarios, what we're actually afraid of is the sensation of fear. Right. Yep. So if you take like a networking scenario, for example, you're like, there's a guy over there who I should talk to because, you know, maybe they'll be able to get me ahead in, in my career, whatever it is. But you then feel a sense of fear around talking to him because, you know, what if, what if he doesn't want to talk to me? What if, all of these what ifs, then that sensation of fear is so great. You don't want to feel the sensation of fear. So instead of approaching him and moving through the fear and having the conversation, which I'm sure will be fine when you have it, you shirk back to a place that is safe because you don't want to feel the fear associated with moving towards him. And when you actually have the guts, you take that moment to feel the fear, you stand there for a moment in the fear, and you just experience fear, eventually what you realize is that fear is not going to kill you. You talk to the guy, you get through the fear, you talk to the guy and everything went great. Like, what was the problem? The only problem was you were afraid of fear. And if you are not afraid to actually stand in the fear, pause there for a moment where you, before you talk to the guy and say, I'm feeling effing terrified and that's completely okay because it's just a sensation. This is just my body lying to me at the moment. And you know what? I can handle the sensation of fear. It's, it's just a sensation. It's like being tickled having sex. I mean, these are all just sensations. Yeah. And I can get to the other side. At that moment, fear no longer has power over you. It is no longer something you are afraid of. And every one of your fears can begin to dissolve away at the same moment because they're all just the same thing. Fear of fear. Can you do it in a way where, right, like the brain reacts the same way, whether you're physically in that room 
or whether you're sitting in the comfort of your own home, having the visualization and the thought mm -hmm. of like, Hey, I'm going to go talk to this guy, right? Like the same or similar chemistry is firing in your body at that moment. Totally. I mean, doing the thing is always more powerful than imagining the thing, but imagining thing is a great place to start. So if there's something that you're afraid of, sit there and imagine yourself doing it and you'll get like the little rise of fear as you, as you do it, but you're like, Hey, this is just imagination. It's totally safe for me to try it. Just feel the fear associated with it. Get through to the other side and do the thing in your imagination. Do it over and over and over again until you no longer feel a rise. Then you can start trying the thing in real life. And maybe you only get halfway through and you say, okay, today I'm going to do like halfway to that thing. Tomorrow I'm going to do three quarters of the way. The next day I'm going to do the whole thing. I might be terrified, but I know it's totally safe. It's just fear. It's okay. And then after that, it becomes easy. How long, from a, from a science perspective, I'm sure you guys have studied this, like people always say like, how long does it take to create that new pathway or that new habit? You know, that's, you say, I'm sure you've studied it, but there's a lot of, um, there's not agreement in how long it takes. Hmm. You know, you might've heard the classic, um, it takes 21 days to start a meditation practice. If you meditate for 21 days, then you've got the habit. Um, and there's some amount of merit to it, but not really good stats. Yeah. Um, I've heard another habit researcher tell me that it's 75 hours when you practice something, a new habit, a new belief. So limiting beliefs are particularly hard things. So you have to practice a new belief that replaces a limiting belief for 75 hours until it becomes like yours and natural. Um, it, it really varies. There is not yet good research on it that tells you exactly how long, but definitely the more you do it, the easier and better it gets. I, so I was thinking um, with the body, <clears throat> I got caught a little bit on like just calling the body a lie and not because I don't agree with you, but it's like, you, you know, we have different um, mechanisms that are, are receiving this life experience, right? So the mm -hmm. body receives life in a specific way. And so you mentioned it too, because right, like the traditional Buddhist teachings is like, just watch the sensation, just watch the mm -hmm. sensation, right? And a lot of people are very challenged with that because they, like you said, they go along for the ride uh, of the experience and they don't get to watch it. So like we're getting the, so I guess my initial question is like, what's giving feedback first? Is the body experiencing something and sending up information to the brain that's then being interpreted? Or are we experiencing something through these senses that the body, oh, you've broken the body up. is responding. Sorry. Hold on. You broke oh, up. Sorry. You broke up. I missed half the question. Yeah. Am, I, am I back now? Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. My, my, my question was like, so what's experiencing life first? Is the body having an experience and then sending a signal up to the brain and the brain's interpreting that reality in a specific way? Or are we seeing, we're, we're listening, we're seeing something over here and then that's sending, sending the information down to the body and the body is now responding correlated to that? Or is it some kind of like a hybrid model? It's a hybrid model. And so I should also clarify that the body's not always lying to you. Yeah. Um, there are just some situations that can be very, very compelling and sticky in which the body's lying to you. There's sure, lots of situations gonna, in which the body does not lie to you at all. And the body, you know, knows fascinating truths. And I in no way mean to undermine that. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't mind it for me because, I, you know, I have my own practices. I'm concerned about anybody watching this and go, oh my God, I can't trust my body. And then it actually starts like an attachment to the brain. They're looking at their body and everything becomes just distrustful down here where this is like an incredible tool that can give you incredible feedback about your experience. I, I, I was like, the only thing that seems to matter is can you get to that pure state of observation where you become the objective observer, both of the mind and the body, so that the energy that's trying to move through, at least again, my experience is, is attempting to liberate, but because of like the interpretation, the stories in the mind and and how we're looking at things, it's, it's almost like we're not enabling the energy to move and it never actually fully liberates from the system. Because ultimately, you know, what we see a lot of um, therapeutic benefit with our clientele is um, giving them practices that introduce three things. Um, how to feel safer, like you said, whether it's an actionable thing or just in actually going into the experience but noticing that there's safety. Um, well-being like just as a general feeling like actually opening of channels in the body that can receive well-being and then actually being in connection with another person like noticing the yeah. energetic connection between people because a lot of times in the traumatic moments there's like a feeling of i'm all alone i'm in shame and i'm in guilt i want to turn away from having connection uh and the engagement system of the body seems to shut down so it's like if you can re-engage those three things what we have found like 
like tremendous therapeutic um, help for people with that. So yeah, I was just curious about um, what's the biology really like versus what am I feeling in my system that feels true. Cool. There is so many things there that I can pick up and comment on. Um, and I, I, I very much agree with you. And so let me take a moment to actually talk about um, the therapeutic value of experiencing emotion in the body. So most of us shut off from experiencing emotion because we're afraid of it, because we don't want to feel that feeling. And so the practice that you were referencing as of observing the sensation in the body without making story about it is incredibly valuable. And so that is a little bit different than what I was talking about when I said the body lies to you. So when, when I say the body lies to you, it means that their brain it makes up stories about what's going on in our body and our body's telling us a story that's not actually aligned to reality. Um, the body is telling you a story that is consistent with its own experience though, which may not be the same as reality. And so you do want to listen to your body's own experience and give it the time and space to communicate with you about it. So, you know, if you had shame in your past and you're unwilling to experience a sensation of that shame because it's so intensely painful, there is something that may well remain unprocessed in your body. And when you're able to get to the point where you can watch your physiology through the physiological experience of pain, aka emotion, hold space for that emotion, observe that emotion without getting sucked into it. Mm. And then allow it to, you know, rise, process, cry if you need to, whatever it is, and move through. Then you have been able to liberate something that has been stuck inside of you for a very long time, which you refer to as like a stuck energy. So, yes, completely, a hundred percent on board. I want a shirt. I'm just throwing this out there, okay? You're the you're the wizards. I want a shirt that tracks moving that energy through the body <laughs> throughout the body imagine, oh, imagine, yeah. imagine if you could like find that source of like hey bring your awareness here and it just kind of like holds that little ping and then tells you how it's moving and relaxing and it's like just yeah. ease into it and just stay here it'd be fascinating and when you're able to also transform it through two of the other things that you mentioned you know a, a sense of or three well-being safety and relationship, then that transformation becomes even more powerful. And that relationship can be between you, like a higher observing self, and a part of yourself that feels in pain. Mm -hmm. So if there's a part of your body in which there is a stuck emotional sensation from a previous experience, when you're able to bring the loving, nurturing, wise you to observe that experience, hold it safely and lovingly, give it the space to non-judgmentally, another important meditation concept, non-judgmentally experience what it's experiencing, not shut it down, not create stories about it, and just give it your own relationship to it, that own like, you know, that, that sort of transformational experience that comes from being observed safely by someone who's not judging you, who just makes it okay to be you. Uh -huh. You can do that to yourself. Um, and then, you know, allow it to feel sensations of safety once it passed through, then that is really a trifecta for healing, that ability to do that with and for yourself. Go ahead, bro. I have so many questions. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> you know I have what? so many more thoughts. Like, yeah. I told you. you know what? For, for like 15, 20 years, right, I've heard so many different things, but to have the person who's like firsthand experiencing it is really different than reading in a book or hearing someone um, report about some case study that was done. So like, I mean, we're going to go big picture here, but like free will, <laughs> 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 right? So there's like, I've heard that there's been this study since the sixties called like the wiggle your finger study. And so they put like electrodes on people and they just said, they're basically trying to test whether free will exists. Right. So the intention mm -hmm. is just like wiggle your finger whenever, whenever the mood strikes you. And if, we can track it some way, we would know that free will is what's moving the finger. Today, again, anecdotally, I believe that intention probably comes before whatever it is that we're calling free will. And intention may or may not even exist within the subset of the body. It could be like an antenna that's picking up information from the ether. I'm not really clear. So as far as I understand, when that test is done, they get like two blips, you know, like there's two readings. And the second reading on this on this blip of thing is is <laughs> actually the, is, is the thought. That's a scientific term right yeah the blip of thing right like again i don't have i don't have a doctorate so the blip of thing uh the second blip is the thought to move the finger 
the first blip happens be between a second to seven seconds before the thought to move the finger. And science has not been able to determine what the first blip is. Again, anecdotally, I would say it's intention or something like that. I'm, I'm been curious for about 20 years about getting feedback from somebody in the scientific community about these studies and like, what do you think is actually happening there? Like, what what is the deal with free will? Do we have it? Do we not? Oh man, that's a <laughs> that's a really 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 big question, and I yeah. don't know what the first blip is either. And there's okay. a lot of debate. There's you know there's debate that says that there is an intention that happens even before the question is asked. Wow. Yeah, that there's like like point ten milliseconds before the question, there is you you see the first blip of intention. Um, and so the, the research here is really, really not clear. That's amazing. It's so cool that like science is still just asking these amazing questions. And I, you know, I'm curious with someone with your fields, and I put an S at the end of it, of expertise, like what's the question that's keeping you up? Like, what's the thing that you're most interested in kind of theorizing over the next bunch of years? So the question that we are asking ourselves now is how do we help make people aware of their own internal thought process, give them control over it, though control is a weird word. Um, And then how do we deliver essentially like a coaching paradigm that can then make people aware of when they need to be aware of their thought process. Mm. So it's really, it's really how do we then use technology to kind of enhance or exacerbate these internal processes and let you know when you should be paying attention to it. So that's, that's like one sphere of questioning. Um, For, Myself, one question that I really think a lot about is how do you get people to? Oh, so, sorry, my child is hollering. Oh, no worries. <laughs> one sec. Yeah. <laughs> one second, one sec. Yeah, no, we both, have, we both have one of those. We know how it goes. <laughs> how interesting is that, right? About the uh, free will. Oh. I thought about asking that question for like 15 years. He's the perfect person to ask it to. Yeah. And then ironically, right. Like it, it comes down to that. We don't freaking know. And science can't quantify what's happening in the ethereal. Yeah, this is so brilliant. <laughs> it's hilarious. We, lo- we love you, by the way. We would, we could pick your brain for 65 days. I said, I, I like, I get like uh, tingly talking to her. I'm yeah. like, Woo! It's, it's just so fun because I know that you're both spiritual and scientific and it's a really beautiful combination when somebody who is working in a very rigid structured environment can also open up to other things. And I want to let you answer the question and then, then I have uh, one, one more follow up after that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll, I'll just re answer the question um, from the beginning so you can edit it cleanly if you need to. So we've been thinking about a number of things. So one thing that we think a lot about as a company is how can we use biosignals and the information that's coming off of people's body to then give them more insight about themselves, to make them aware of their thought process, to make them aware of how their heart is beating, how their breath is regulating, and then use that for us to be able to then give you coaching and tips and feedback to say like, hey, pay attention to this now. Hey, we taught you something previously. Now's the time to learn, you know, apply the exercise. We're also really thinking about what brain health means and how we can apply, you know, both exercises for the heart, which is critical for brain health, as well as um, meditation exercises, as well as other things outside of meditation to really be able to help you improve the resilience and versatility and, you know, longevity of your own brain. One thing that I think a lot about is love. And love is really phenomenally, tremendously healing. You know, most of us go through our lives always seeking love and hoping that we could have love filled up for a brief moment and not recognizing that love is something that we have that just is. And I went through this transformation myself. I came from an incredibly loving household. And it wasn't until I recognized that my mother gave me unconditional love and that was a gift and I just had it like Mm. period. 
And the moment I recognized that, it's sort of like every fiber of my body released. There was no longer this seeking that was happening. There was no longer this, you know, need to please. There was no longer getting upset at my husband when I filled the dishwasher wrong because I felt like he might yell at me and therefore mean that I wasn't worthy of his love. Like, it's incredible what we do psychologically and subconsciously to try to get ourselves love and recognition, aka more love. Yeah. And, and when I felt the completion of unconditional love, which took a hell of a long time to get to, even though it was something I really had the whole time, it was transformational. Yeah. And so I'm very interested in how we allow people to understand love and understand safety in very visceral ways inside of their body. Because once you do that, it leads to a whole host of really positive social behaviors. It, you know, melts away anger. It melts away scarcity thinking. It melts away othering and allows us to live much more comfortably inside our own shells as us. I have chills all over my body. Yeah. If um, we can support that in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> that, Thank you. I mean, that, you know, it's interesting because it's like, yeah. Guy said it before, science is this amazing thing that keeps, in essence, proving things that humans have kind of intuitively known for a long time. And hearing what you just said and knowing the work that we do with people, which is all about bringing safety and unconditional love internally first so that they can be the best versions of themselves out there and then bring that through. And like the thought, just even the glimmer of hope that at some point we will have some sort of technology that can bring this to anyone in the world. Like I, it's like moving me to tears to think that that's the humanity that we get to live into. Like that is oh, so beautiful. Thank you. And I think, I don't know that there's a technology that's going to get us there. And I, I think a lot about what it could be. Like, what are the, what are the tools? What are the ways that we can get people to be in the state more often, to feel comfortable in the state, to accept the state? You know, there's, there's no, currently there's no heart monitor that will tell you if there is love in your heart or not, or that will remind you to have love in your heart. We just, we, still don't even know the you know EKG or electromagnetic imprint of love sufficiently. Um, and so we're, we're a long way from a technological solution, but the good news is there's probably hundreds and hundreds and millions and probably billions of human solutions between now and then. Yeah. And that's what we need to keep working on. Oh. So we're not yeah. going to be out of a career anytime soon, Elon. That's what you're again? Nope, nope. We're you you guys have a lot of work career. cut out for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just waiting for like Muse 3.0 to come out and then it's like the coaching industry is just in tatters because... I, mean, it is <laughs> I was actually system. just watching a funny show. Oh, you were there with us, <laughs> the Magic for Humans, where he does yeah, this yeah, whole yeah. thing about robots taking over their jobs. And my kids looked at me like, is there going to be a robot that someday stops you from coaching? I was like, oh, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ariel, I would love to honestly keep you here and having this conversation for hours and hours because I, like I said, my brain just keeps firing every time you're around. You answer something and it's like, oh, let's go play in this thing. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully we can even have you back. That'd be really fun. Uh, for now, how can people find out about you and Muse and, and what you're up to? I know you mentioned the podcast, but please mention that again as well. Sure. So I have a podcast that I co-host called Untangle, where we talk about neuroscience and meditation in the mind. If you're curious about Muse, you can find it at choosemuse.com. Um, and if you want to find myself, I'm on Instagram at Ariel's Musings and Twitter at Ariel.Garten. Amazing. 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 Thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much for doing what you do in the world and asking the big ass questions that you ask and having a team and funding to bring forth the most sci-fi cool shit that will actually help humanity. Um, it's amazing. I just wish you guys the best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to chat. This was a lot of fun. Thank yeah. you for being here. Thank awesome. You. All right, guys, we'll see you on the next episode. And until then, have an amazing week. Bye, everybody.